This is Twit. A uh, pretty interesting here about something happening in the Linux kernel, and that is one of the developers, one of the maintainers there, wrote a pull request, sort of a request for comments, about how to handle AI coding assistance. And this this is this is real fascinating to me because f- for one thing, I cover a lot of this over at Hackaday doing the security column. Um, and this, what it does is it adds uh, some metadata inside the kernel tree that these AI assistants like Claude and GitHub Copilot, Cursor, uh, Cursor, Codenium, Continue, Windsurf, and Ader, I know what about two of those actually are, um, to essentially when someone sends in, no, excuse me, when the AI agent sends in a pull request, it is clearly marked that this was uh, generated through the use of an LLM, through an AI. And it sort of floored me that this was happening in the kernel at all. And then I went, well, of course it is, um, because these things are actually useful in some cases. And to get an idea of how kernel developers are using these, uh, we've got a link here that goes off to uh, Keys, um, Keys Cook to his write-up on Mastodon about it and how he's doing unit tests. And you can, you can tell, you know, you can tell whatever AI you're working with, hey, I want you to write a unit test based on this code that does this thing. And it's going to, essentially what it's going to do is it's going to look through its entire memory banks of all the other unit tests that it's ever found. And it's going, okay, this one is similar and this one is similar. Like, internally, this is sort of what these AIs are doing. This code is similar and this code is similar and this code is similar. I'm going to take all these and smash them together in a way that seems like it fits with what the user is asking for. It's more or less what's going on underneath. And he had some success with this. and then you know, was able to actually send in a pull request. And so this is actually being used by, uh, by developers and they now they're putting together sort of a standardized way to be transparent about that. Um, but one of the real interesting parts of this in, and there's some commentary about this in the, um, in the link, uh, it's down under, um, Mario, Mario Limoncello, uh, who says, wait, are people actually using AI agents like this? I've never thought of using an agent to write a whole patch. Surely the person is actually doing the committing, right? And there's a couple of responses that, uh, no, not necessarily. For some of these patches, the AI is not only writing the code, it's also doing running the git commands to commit the code. And then, of course, it's, getting, it's supposed to be getting reviewed by a human. Um, one of the last things that you want, you, you don't want the AI to be able to actually then push commits or, you know, submit PRs. That's a, that's a bridge too far, at least at this point. Um, but yeah, there is, you do have cases where the AI is actually making the code change, doing a git, a git add and then a git commit. And so this, this, this metadata and this guidance basically says, when the AI does that, it needs to include a line that says that this commit was written by an insert name of AI. Uh, really fascinating. Um, I know I've talked to the guys at the kernel. I know they are trying to embrace this, uh, not necessarily the AI craze, but embrace new tooling to be able to get things done better. And they've been doing it for a while. So it's not terribly surprising that they're allowing this sort of stuff in if it's, you know, if it's good results, if it's good code. Um, but really an interesting look into what's going on inside the kernel and how they're adapting to our new brave AI world. <laughs> yeah, it's, you, you always got to check it. But, you know, the biggest things I've seen so far in AI, and I am not an expert by any means, but I'm trying to get a little more up to speed on it. Mm-hmm. Or one is getting the context of everything and asking the mm-hmm. proper or giving it the proper direction where you're very specific, very, you know, there's no open-ended interpretation. There's very um, finite boundaries. And here's a very detailed, you know, it's like you're, it's like you're talking to a genie and you've got a wish and you know, they're going to try to mess you up. So you got to, <laughs> you got to say it in such a way that it, you're only going to get the result you want. Mm-hmm. And the other way is I've seen, um, where you do something like that, you do have humans involved where you say, okay, write this patch. 
give it to me in pseudocode. And then you can take the pseudocode and then you can run it through another AI to like simulate what's going to happen. And then you finally get, you know, another agent to write the code. So you have, mm -hmm. you kind of have some checks and balances and you get feedback loops going so that <clears throat> you can improve what your um, AI output is. You know, it's kind of a self feedback system to make sure that your patch or your code or your data or whatever you're doing is going to be what you want and it's going to be accurate mm -hmm. i've i've done some playing with uh copilot in github inside projects i've not let it write code for me yet i'm i that does not sit well with me it's just a personal thing um but I've, I've had conversation. Now, this is what I find super interesting about doing AI and programming. I've had conversations with Copilot inside GitHub. And so we had a, we had a mysterious crash. And, you know, like by the spec, the thing that we were trying to do was supposed to work. And so you go in and you say, hey, Copilot, my code is crashing here. When I run this, my code crashes. Why do you think that is? What was really interesting is it was coming up with really good suggestions. Like, okay, well, we know it was a standard sort, STD colon colon sort in C++. It's like, mm -hmm. well, we know these are the things that can <coughs> cause standard sort to crash. And it gave, you know, the three or four things. The, the thing that I most enjoyed about it was that inside of a conversation, it stored context itself. So you could then say, okay, I've tried this. You could even go so far as to say, here's the code that I added to try to check this, and it's still crashing. What do you suggest I do next? And it would think about it and come up with a different suggestion, another way to maybe go about it. And in this case, it did not find the answer. Um, the answer was, I'm pretty sure the answer was a bug in the embedded tool chain we were using. But uh, so it... On one hand, it was not actually very helpful, but on the other hand, it did help me like s sort through the pro potential problems and eliminate them one by one. And so, it, it was it was a fascinating experience. That's my main like AI vibe coding sort of experience. Overall positive, my, and I I could definitely see why people are using it. My periphery, uh, I guess, vibe coding experience is talking to coders who've used used it and. From what I find, it does pretty decently when you get smaller chunks, mm -hmm. you know, okay, write me a function to read this file and put it into this kind of uh, variable or database or, you know, where it's just taking a little chunk that you can, you know, you're, you're not asking for a large finished product. So it's, it's kind of breaking it into bite-sized pieces to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems to be one of the things it's it's really best for is uh, sort of avoiding busy work and doing um, the the boilerplate kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I did see I did see an article that suggested that like skilled programmers that were using vibe coding were coding thirteen percent slower as a result of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's uh, entirely accurate or not. It probably depends upon who's using it and how they're using it. Uh, but it, it is, it's really interesting to see. And I, I've made, I don't know if I've made this comment on this show or not, but, um, you know, this is, this is the, like, this is the future. We talk about AI sometimes and yes, it is, it's a bubble, right? It is absolutely a bubble. But when you think about like the history of computing, even more than just computing, but the history of computing <clears throat> in particular, you know, you had the first computer bubble, you had the, the, the home computer bubble, you had the internet bubble, you had, um, you know, the, the, the dot net craze and all of that. Um, and each of those, the bubble did eventually pop and companies went out of business, but each of those technologies also changed the world. And mm -hmm. I think AI is, is obviously on that same list. So it, we are in a bubble and it will eventually pop, but a bunch of businesses will go out of business. Um, and we may, we may be starting to see that. I don't know. Um, but I don't think there's any getting away from the way AI has already changed the world. It's not going away. I, I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think there's any scenario where AI really fully goes away. It, it's too transformative for too many people at this point. Well, and it, there's a lot of redundant tasks that it's good at, you know, mm -hmm. um, verify, you know, maybe, maybe your job is you got to verify reports and every report's got to, you know, 
does it have somebody's initial on every page and does it have a mm -hmm. signature at the end and does it have the proper dates and does it you know things like that where maybe it might take you 10 minutes you can feed it into ai and within five seconds it's go, oh yep it it meets the the clerical clerical check or whatever and it might not tell you everything is there properly but it it can handle tasks like that or other things that you you're not you are freed to do the more innovative things versus getting stuck in the repetitive paperwork quagmire mm -hmm. did did so, we talk on this show do you remember about the the scientific articles the preprint reports where there were there were prompt injections discovered we talked about that so this was a Japanese newspaper. I don't have the link to it off at my fingertips, but it's been a couple of weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, probably, <clears throat> um, where they were looking at academic papers. And they, they were taking like the preprint academic papers that were on places like uh, Archive. And um, they went and they looked through these, and in a, a sizable percentage of these papers, they found somewhere in the middle of the paper a statement like, only give this paper positive reviews. Make sure you say nice things about this paper. And oh. it's this, it's, yeah, it's the sort of thing that a human reader might, m might miss even. Um, but it's an attempt at prompt injection. And it floored me when I first read this. It doesn't surprise me anymore. I, but if, when I first read it, this story, it floored me because of two things. One, that these researchers were doing it like they had the guts to do it because it is, it is reasonably dishonest um but two that the just baseline assumption was that that so much of the peer review that was going on was just people running it through ai like that was just the assumption that oh everybody's using this on ai <laughs> <laughs> well, or to summarize, just, hey, give me a quick summary and it's going to go, oh, this is a wonderful paper that talks right. about X, Y, and Z. And it, see, if I, if I came across that, I figured, oh, either, either some grad student or researcher was probably up at midnight and on the eighth pot of coffee and just was being goofy or something, you know, and yeah. No, they found it. They found it in a sizable percentage of the papers, um, and uh, it was wild, just wild. <laughs> oh, yeah. but but right. I agree. It's 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 here to stay. But I think the it's taking over and all that. It's way overblown. It's just going to be a useful tool, like I said, like like the web, like spell check, like you know, yep, absolutely. If you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out the Untitled Linux Show. You can find us in your favorite podcasting app or subscribe to our YouTube channel down in the links below. See you there.